linear versus non-linear data. Now you're scratching your head already. Well, fear not, I will do my best to explain all. Here we go. Hi, and welcome to episode 60 of Understanding Darktable. I wanted to do something a little bit different in this episode, and it's going to mean we're not even going to look at Darktable. We're not even going to process an image. About a month ago, late in February of 2020, I sent an email to Aurelien Pierre, and this was in reference to a thread that he started on pixels.us about linear versus nonlinear data. And in my email to him, I said, Aurelian, I don't expect you to write a 5,000 word essay, but I was wondering if you could point me to a resource which could help me to understand what you mean by linear versus nonlinear data, uh, as you made reference to in this thread. And he wrote back what was pretty much a 5,000 word essay. <laughs> And, uh, and he said, oh, look, I can't point you to a resource. He said, but it's, it's quite simple, really. And <laughs> classic Aurelian. And uh, so I thought I would address that email in this particular episode um, in the hopes that this will just shed a little bit of light, no pun intended, on that whole concept of linear versus nonlinear data. So his email says, hi, Bruce. I don't have a specific resource for that, but the explanation is, I believe, quite simple. Your camera... Actually, you know what? Before I read this whole email, let's just go down to the end of it because I want to read the last paragraph. Too long, did not read. Linear RGB is what comes out of your camera sensor, and it means that the RGB code values are directly, or in other words, mathematically, connected to the light intensity. Perform multiplications and additions in linear RGB, and that will keep the linearity of the RGB. Anything else turns it into nonlinear, which is useful for creative reasons and integer file encodings, but it should happen after any operation that relies on the physical consistency between code values and light emissions. Now, at this point in time, that probably still sounds like Greek to you, unless, of course, you're Greek. Let's just work our way through the email, and hopefully this will all make sense in the end. So he says, your camera sensor converts photons of light into electrons with a piece of semiconductor underneath the color filter array. Roughly, one photon becomes one electron except for some that get lost here and there. But for the sake of this explanation, you can assume one photon equals one electron. It's really like a photovoltaic solar cell that you would use to produce electricity, except the amount of electricity is quite small. Once we have a current, all we have to do is then measure the value of that electric current, i.e. the sum of all of the electrons passing through the wire at each photo site. And each photo site is essentially each pixel on the sensor. It's, it's basically like a bucket that collects light. And I think I've explained this before that, you know, the more light that goes into that photo site, the brighter the luminosity, and then the Bayer color array that's over the top of the sensor that filters the uh, different colored parts of the light spectrum so that we end up with different colors in our images. Okay, it's really just measuring how many micro amperes we have there, as you would do with a good old fashioned multimeter, but much more sensitive. Using a piece of electronics called an analog to digital converter, an ADC, which I personally am already familiar with. I'm a professional audio engineer and I could talk to you till the cows come home about how an analog to digital converter takes an analog voltage of audio, of you know, any audio signal, and converts that into binary data that any piece of software, whether it be recording software or playback software, can then turn back into an analog signal and play out of our speakers. 
So I, I already understand the concept of an analog to digital converter. So he says, using an ADC, that current measurement is converted to an integer code value inside some predetermined range. Now, if you use 8 bits for your conversion, like a JPEG image, then the maximum possible range is 0 to 2 to the 8th minus 1, which gives us a range of 0 to 255. And if you've looked at any, you know, curves tool or levels tool in, you know, Photoshop or GIMP or anything like that, you've probably seen those numbers on that range. Most cameras shoot raw 12 or 14 bit, so they can encode data between 0 and 4095 for a 12 bit image, or 0 and 16383 for a 14 bit image. And for every bit that you increase the word length, I'm going off the script here, this is not a really, and this is me, for every bit you add to the word length of a raw file, you double that range of values which can represent everything from pure black to pure white. Okay, back to Aurelian. These code values don't mean much in themselves. They only mean that we split the measurement range of the sensor between the noise threshold and the saturation threshold, in other words, pure black and pure white, into that many samples as defined by the number of bits we're using, right? So as the sampling gets finer, in other words, as you use longer word lengths, your lightness gradients are more continuous and less prone to staircasing effects, what's called posterization or quantization artifacts. Just imagine you want to represent a diagonal line with a staircase. The more steps you add, the finer the jumps get and the smoother the approximation of your line gets. Does that make sense? But these code values are a linear encoding, meaning if you double the amount of light that hits the sensor, you also double the code value issued by the measurement. That leads to a nice property doubling the light amount physically on the scene or multiplying the code values by two digitally in the computer has the same effect on the picture. Linearity means the data you are working on is proportional to the intensity or energy of the light emission. Makes sense. Mathematically, linearity of some operation which we'll call f for function, is proven if A times F times B is equal to F times A times B, which means that you can multiply in the order that you want before or after applying that function on the value of B, and the result will not change. But here you might smell an issue. Remember, human vision is logarithmic and therefore nonlinear. That means we have increased sensitivity in shadows and decreased sensitivity in highlights. The human light increment is the EV or the exposure value. From one EV to another, you double or halve the amount of light depending on which way you go. Your camera code values, let's say in 12 bit, encode the first EV below pure white between 4095 and 4096 divided by 2, which is equal to 2047. It means that half your encoding range is assigned to only the first one EV below pure white, where your sensitivity as a human being is very low. Then the second EV is encoded between 2047 and 1023. So it's only half the amount of data to represent the next whole exposure stop, right? 
The third one is between 1,023 and 511, which is a quarter of what was assigned to the first EV. Fourth is between 511 and 254. Fifth is between 253 and 127, et cetera, et cetera, until the 12th, which can only take a value of zero or one. It's crazy. That means the EV parts where you are the most sensitive are the ones that get the least code values, which is kind of a little bit backward, really. You would think where we are most sensitive, we would assign more values, but that's not the way it works. That triggers a lot of problems. The most common being posterization in the shadows, staircasing in the shadow gradients. We have two ways of dealing with that. Either ditch the integer encoding and switch to floating point representation. And I'll just interject here. Basically what floating point does is multiply all the values by some large number. And what that does is give you more numbers to play with even at that lowest EV, right? So, and it works exactly the same in audio by oversampling, because that's essentially what oversampling is. You are multiplying that range of values as, as Aurelian says, that 12th stop only gets to have a value of zero and one. If we multiply every one of those ranges of values by 1000, suddenly that darkest EV, you know, that uses that 12th bit of our 12 bit word length, instead of only having two values to play with, it now has 2000 values to play with, which means that when you perform adjustments to exposure or contrast or whatever, instead of only having a one or a zero to choose from, suddenly the software has 2,000 values that it can map just for that darkest range of shadows. And then at the point of export, you divide everything back down by 1,000 to get back to your original word length. And what that does is it smooths out the rounding errors, basically. There's a, there's a whole lot of maths behind it, which I'm not going to try and go into because I'll only dig myself a great big hole. Anyway, back to Aurelian. So we either ditch the integer encoding and switch to floating point representation so we don't care about the sampling anymore and we could assume a continuous real encoding in the full range. Or we redistribute the human-defined EV stops around code values that are more even by applying a nonlinear transform, the typical 2.2 gamma, which applies a sort of square root. The lab transfer function applies a cubic root and modern video cameras apply a log directly. So each EV gets roughly the same number of code values and the first EV stops sucking up half of the values for itself. Now, the first approach is better for working on pictures because it preserves the linear connection between the light emission that occurred at the time of exposure and the actual code values that are generated by the multimeter, quote unquote. So it keeps the multiplication property, along with many more that allow physically accurate light transforms, and that's how dark tables pipeline works. But saving files in 32-bit float is really heavy and it's overkill. To save files, we will use approach number two, which is what modern gamma-encoded RGB spaces like Adobe RGB and sRGB do. So nonlinear RGB spaces are just that, a maths trick to redistribute the code values more evenly between exposure values that should be used only for file saving or to send image buffers to your GPU and then to your screen. If you plan on working on pictures, 
saved with a gamma encoding, you should decode it first, then apply your image operations, then re-encode and save the result. But for some reason, the whole graphics industry has taken on this bad habit of working directly on these gamma encoded files through the whole pipeline, probably because it pegs the 18% middle gray at around 50%. Now, I don't understand how the maths works here, but I'd, I'll take him at face value. So 0 0.18, which represents 18%, to the square root of 1 over 2.2 .2 equals 0 0.46, which is roughly 0.5, okay? So it's more convenient to use with levels or curves from a graphic user interface point of view because that 18% middle gray now appears to be dead center rather than just, you know, a little bit in from one side of the graph, whichever way the 18% works. And then users can introduce nonlinear transforms too, even in a linear pipeline, for example, by applying a tone curve or a LUT. Basically, every lightness or contrast operator that is not a simple multiplication and or addition, that is not an exposure compensation, will delinearize the RGB, which is fine for creative purposes if you ensured that every physically accurate transform comes earlier in your pipeline. And this is the very reason I don't like hiding pipelines from the users, because it's important to know what operation you're doing on which signal even if it means they have to wrap their head around non-intuitive concepts. Otherwise, you'd spend hours trying to figure out where those artifacts came from and why you couldn't get rid of them. And then we're back to his final paragraph. Cheers, Aurelian. Okay, so thank you, Aurelian, for the response. I think I get it. I think I understand the concept of why you would prefer to work with linear data rather than logarithmic data, I think. Um, and I hope this has helped somebody out there to understand the relationship between the two. As far as Darktable is concerned, my major issue is not knowing which color space each module works in. Some of them are, it's obvious by the name, like RGB curve, filmic RGB. It's obvious that they work in an RGB color space. But there are other modules that work in lab and there are other modules that, that also work in RGB and there doesn't seem to be a simple way that I know of to identify exactly which color space a particular module uses for its transform. Now I know Aurelian did post, and, and I will dig out the link to that post that he wrote that has a description of which modules he recommends and which ones he thinks you should stay away from, and I will link to it up there. But, you know, I don't want to have to keep going back to that to try and remember what modules are RGB and which modules are lab and which ones I should avoid and which ones are okay to use. I'd love it if they could put some kind of an indicator on the title of the module to give us an indication, like just put RGB in brackets or lab in brackets behind the name of every module, just so you could tell by looking at it and go, okay, well, that's an RGB, you know, module and therefore I should use that, or that's lab, I should try and steer away from that. I don't know. I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, I've used most of the modules in Darktable at some point in time, and I've always felt like I have got much better results out of Darktable than I ever got out of Lightroom, regardless of whether those modules that I used were RGB or lab. So... I don't know what the answer is. Um, 
I'll, I'll take a really in at face value that, you know, we should be working in linear encoded data for the image processing uh, and then transform it back into a nonlinear model just at the point of export or display on our computer screens while we're working. Um, yeah, there's bits that I understand and there are bits that I don't. So I hope that's been helpful. But before I close off, I did want to address an email that I got from Bob Fenske, uh, who wrote to me a couple of weeks ago, and he said, Hello, Bruce, I've been thoroughly enjoying your video series, and episode 51 is my next. I thought I might share with you my thought process or focus points as I watch your video from the perspective of a Lightroom user. My general strategy is to view all of your videos before any attempt to dive in. Focus point one. I keenly watch for tools and techniques that you demonstrate that I recognize and know from Lightroom. These act as confidence building points, i.e. I already know this, I just need to learn what dark table buttons to push, if you will. And you won't be surprised to hear me say that I recognize a lot in Darktable that I already know from Lightroom. So, focus point one is a real biggie for me. Focus point two. Here, I'm picking up the many new features, or in some cases, similar features found in Lightroom, but considerably more powerful in Darktable. And of course, Darktable gives me a long list of new features and techniques to discover. Focus point two is the exciting part for me. Focus point three is really a question to myself as I watch and learn from you. The question is, what does Darktable not give me that Lightroom currently does? At the moment, I see a couple of what for me are quite significant. One, no direct ability to develop a book and send it to a publisher like Blurb. Have to find a workaround for that one. Two, Data asset management. You'll not be surprised that I'm kind of married to my current folder system built around place or genre mostly. I've given up on working by dates. Perhaps experience with Darktable will show me this loss is more perceived than real. Bruce, my last thought is something I wonder if you might consider doing some form of short video about dealing with the aspect of security around open source software. I've only recently done a cursory review of the chatter out there, and I understand there are a few security tests and checks and software as well. The video might answer the question. Darktable, is it safe? Thanks for listening. Cheers from Salt Spring Island, British Columbia. Bob Finsky. Well, Bob, I'm going to answer that last bit first. Me doing a video about security and open source software? Sorry, man. Totally not my wheelhouse. I would not even know where to start. The only thing I would throw in on that subject would be my completely uneducated understanding that the beauty of open source software is that anyone who knows how to read the, the coding language of software can download the software and actually look at it. And that is why on Linux, you very rarely will find any malware or viruses because everything's open source, which means if some nefarious person decided that they wanted to try and ship malware or a virus in a piece of open source software, it would take two seconds flat for the whole community to go, what is this crap? Get rid of that. And it would get flicked from whatever repository it was stored in. Um, so, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm certainly no expert on security in Linux, uh, but my understanding of, you know, open source software is that that is one of its great strengths is it's very difficult for anyone to ship nasty bits of code because everybody who can read it can see it. And if they know what it is, then, you know, the community is going to, you know, downvote that software or, or do whatever has to be done to get rid of it. And so that's why you very rarely find viruses and malware on Linux. 
But like I said, I'm no expert on that subject. So in terms of me doing a video about it, sorry, what you got in the last two minutes, that was it. All right, so let's go back to the start of Bob's email. So focus point one, you're watching for tools and techniques that you already understand from Lightroom. Well, that makes perfect sense. Um, I just need to learn to know what buttons to push. Yep. And you won't be surprised to hear me say that I recognize a lot in Darktable that I already know from Lightroom. And I was exactly the same. And it was one of the things that attracted me to Darktable when I first looked at it in 2016 was the fact that graphically the layout is very similar to Lightroom. So it all made a lot of sense. Certainly dealing with the UI is a little bit trickier than Lightroom. Um, just, you know, elements of the UI require very precise mouse placement. Maybe that's me just getting older, I don't know. But um, yeah, generally there is a lot of similarity between the way the two apps are designed to both look and to be interfaced with. Focus point two, you're picking up on the new features or in some case similar features found in Lightroom, but considerably more powerful in Darktable. Absolutely. You know, the thing I keep on coming back to is, you know, the idea of parametric masks. You know, I remember when I was, you know, in the Lightroom world, you know, which was up until 2016, if you wanted luminosity-based masks, Adobe didn't even offer it. You had to go and buy that from a third-party developer as a plug-in for Lightroom. And then I started tinkering with Linux and found Darktable on my third attempt to find a Lightroom replacement. And there it was, built in, and this is free software. I was like, what? This is incredible. But it's not just luminosity. You know, you can create a mask based on you know, any of the RGB color channels or you can, you know, build a mask based on saturation or, you know, it was just, it's like, wow, this is epic. So yeah, I totally hear what you're saying. And of course, Darktable gives me a long list of new features and techniques to discover. Focus point two is the exciting part. Focus point three, this is a question to myself. What does Darktable not give me that Lightroom currently has? Okay, so in terms of what Lightroom currently has, I don't know because I haven't looked at it since 2016. So I don't know what they have added and what they have not added. I do know where it was at in 2016. Uh, and one of the things that I personally feel is, I mean, you, you can do it in Darktable, but it's just not as simple and elegant as it was in Lightroom is the ability to just brush paint your masks. Yes, you can do it in Darktable and you can adjust the intensity of the, the flow of the mask, if you like, using the control mouse wheel modifier, but it's just not quite the same as Lightroom where you could just paint and paint and paint and paint in multiple strokes to gradually build up a mask. It can be done in Darktable, but it's not quite as elegant. And I'm not bitching. I'm just merely saying that that's my observation, if you like. Um, at the moment, I see a couple of what to me are quite significant. No ability to develop, develop a book and send it to a publisher like Blurb. Yeah, look, okay, I'll go along with you there because I, I very rarely do that kind of stuff. When I do produce a photo book, well, A, I don't use Blurb. I use a manufacturer here in Australia that I really like. Um, and with their particular photo books, they force you to use their particular piece of software. And so what I do is I prepare all of my images in Darktable, export them, as you know, relatively high res images to a temporary folder and then I drag them into their software and I lay out the book the way I want it to look. Actually, hold that thought. I'll be right back. Okay, so the mob I use here in Australia 
is photobookshop.com.au. And no, they are not paying me for an ad. Um, but these guys do a fantastic book. Now, this is my Sri Lanka and Maldives uh, photo book. And I always produce my photo books as a 12 by 12. Um, the reason I do that is so that my landscape shots and my portrait shots can be the same size on a page. That's just me. Okay. Now, all of this, I had to do that manually. Um, there was no way to automate that. So I had to go into GIMP, create a grid, drag in each image, crop them to square, move them into place, export that as a single JPEG that I could then use for the cover image of the book. Now, all of this page layout stuff, I have to do manually, okay? So there's no way to do this from Darktable. Like I said, I just export each image uh, to a temporary folder, and then I drag all of these into the layout software that photobookshop.com.au uses for their production workflow. And the beauty of it is these are stupidly cheap. This book, now this is a, I think this was a hundred page lay flat. And I don't know if you can actually tell, but that, is really heavy paper stock. It's beautiful. It's like 210 GSM. Um, gorgeous paper stock, 100 page, genuine lay flat. Uh, if I find, just give me one second here. I'm looking for a particular image. There's my leopard shot. So genuine lay flat book, 100 pages. This is like 59 Australian dollars stupidly cheap um great mob anyway i like i said they're not paying me to give them an ad <laughs> but um so in terms of book production i'm quite happy to do all that sort of stuff for myself because i feel like taking control of the book production process like that i get you know the layout exactly the way i want it even with lightroom i was never overly blown away with the ability to customize page layout i i don't think it gave you that level of um you know complexity you know being able to put images over the top of another image put drop shadows on those to make them sort of sit up off the all that kind of stuff um each to their own you know if you like being able to do it straight out of the software fair enough i get that but I do have to say, I think you're in the minority. I don't think the production of photo books is a large percentage of the user base of either Darktable or Lightroom, to be honest. I, I would imagine that even out of all people who use Lightroom, the number of people producing photo books out of Lightroom is probably a small percentage of the whole user base. I might be wrong. I don't know. Anyway, uh, number two, data asset management. You'll not be surprised that I'm kind of married to my current folder system built around place or genre. I've given up on working by dates. Perhaps experience with Darktable will show me that this loss is more perceived than real. That's an interesting one. I have always used the date folder naming structure. And I guess the reason for that is that A, makes it easy to back stuff up on a chronological basis. Uh, if you want to do, you know, manual and incremental backups, you know, maybe by month, you know, once you hit the 1st of April, you can go, okay, I can now back up the March folder. Or, you know, I get to January 1, I can back up the 2019 folder or, or whatever that is, you know. So that's one way of doing it. And it's always easy to know what you've backed up and what you haven't backed up. The other side of that, the you know, the data asset management, and again, this is something I've spoken about before, and 
I still absolutely believe in this. One of the things that I absolutely love about Dark Table is the fact that rather than using a catalog file like Lightroom does, you know, a .lr cat file, Darktable stores everything pertaining to an image from the development stages, you know, which model modules you used and what you did with them, to the keywords, to the star ratings, to the color labels, all of that stuff is by default stored in XMP sidecar files. And to me, that is a much smarter, much more robust way of managing all of that information. I recall in my Lightroom days being stung, and okay, you can point the finger and say, well, that was your fault, where I did not have backups enabled for the Lightroom catalog file, and Lightroom crashed on me, or Windows crashed, one or the other. Whether it was Lightroom or Windows is irrelevant, but the the point was that the application terminated abnormally, and the whole catalog got corrupted, and I had no backup, and I lost what was at the time 6,000 images, and everything was gone, all the keywords. That was, that was the killer for me, losing all of that keyword information that I had tagged into you know, probably 4,000 of those 6,000 images along with the star ratings and the color labels, which, yeah, that, that was easy enough to, to rebuild, but the keywords, that was time consuming. In fact, I still have images from, you know, prior to that crash that don't have their keywords added back to them because it's just too big a task and I'm never going to get to it. Uh, to my mind, Darktable's approach of using XMP sidecar files is a much better approach. I can count in the four years I've been using Darktable as I'm recording this, the number of times Darktable has crashed on me, I think has been precisely one time. And when that happened, what did I lose? All of the information pertaining to one image. Every other image was safe because Darktable wasn't accessing the XMP sidecar files for all of the other images in my database at the time it was only accessing that one xmp file so i lost everything i'd done on one image so the next time i booted it up it was like went back to that image and went oh okay i've lost everything so i'll put the keywords back in and i'll put the star rating back in hey i'm right back where i was you know just before the crash not the same deal with a lightroom catalog file now yes Lightroom does offer you the ability to create XMP sidecar files, but it's not the default modus operandi. Why? Because Adobe wants to lock you in their jail. That's why. <sighs> so those are my thoughts on data asset management. Look, Bob, in terms of folder structure, that is absolutely subjective, you know? We're all human beings. We all have different ways in which our brains are wired, you know, and I'm not saying that date folder naming structure is the, the be-all and end-all and should be the only process that people use for managing a hierarchy of images. No, use what works for you. I'm just saying using dates works for me. If it doesn't work for you, that's fine. Don't lose any sleep over it. Um, if you've got a system that does work for you, fantastic. Go with that. Um, I absolutely live and die by keywords. I really do. And it's one of the reasons why, and I think someone has asked me this in the past, why don't I rename my raw files? It's like, I don't need to. I put all of the keyword information into the tags within Darktable. That all gets written into the XMP sidecar files, and that's all I need. 
Because even if I wasn't using Darktable, let's say for some reason I decided to move to raw therapy, raw therapy will read those XMP sidecar files. If, God forbid, I was to go back to Adobe and start using Lightroom, I could import all of those images and Lightroom would read those XMP sidecar files and import all of the keyword and all of the metadata and everything is searchable. So for me, that's that, that's just the way I, I roll when it comes to my asset management of images. You know, everything goes into the keywords, into the tags, and it's all searchable. And I've you know, mentioned, you know, the story of my wife's grandfather when he passed away and I was looking for images of him, you know, and not only did I find the images I knew about, I found images that I'd forgotten about. And it's like, wow, that's awesome. You know, if I was relying just on my memory to go and find those images, I never would have found it, you know, but because I tagged him in whatever images I shot where he was in the shot, uh, you know, I was able to find those images long after the fact. So that's just me. Okay, Bob, mate, thanks for the email. And I trust that uh, since you wrote that email, you've had a chance to watch a few more of the videos. And I hope that at some point you do take the plunge. Uh, I genuinely believe that if you dive into Darktable and spend some time, you know, getting used to its quirks in terms of its UI, it's not a massive shift from Darktable, but there are some little things that are a, a bit different. I genuinely believe you will come to love it. That's just me. But anyway, all right, I am going to leave it right there, people. Once again, thank you once again to all my lovely Patreon supporters. I do want to mention, and at the risk of sounding like I'm trying to drive people to become patrons, which kind of am, but kind of not, um, I am producing more content for the patrons on Patreon patreon.com okay so if you're thinking oh bruce just wants money but i'm not going to get anything for it that's not actually the case i do produce videos that only the patrons get to see um and i've done three more workflow related videos so far for the patrons uh and that's going to be an ongoing series and and they have all been user contributed images so if if that's something that interests you um, consider heading over to patreon.com and uh, slash understanding dark table. Uh, and, you know, it's only going to be a couple of bucks a month if you can afford that. That would be awesome. Alrighty. Now I'm done. I will see you in the next one. <laughs>